Do you think you are building a fully RESTful API, and is that even relevant today? In this video, I'll walk you through Roy Fielding's original work about RESTful APIs. We're also going to discuss the REST maturity levels, and I'll show you how to take an RPC-based HTTP API and elevate it into a fully RESTful API. We have a lot of topics to cover, so let's dive in. If we are going to talk about building RESTful APIs, we have to start from somewhere, and the best place to start is by describing what REST is. So what is REST? It's an acronym for Representational State Transfer. And it was coined by this guy here, his name is Roy Fielding, and he introduced REST in his PhD dissertation titled Architectural Styles and the Design of Network-Based Software Architecture. And this was written all the way back in 2000. And I'm making this video almost a quarter of a century later, where REST has evolved into something completely different from Roy Fielding's original work. So let's discuss the original meaning of REST rest and then we're going to talk about the more modern approach to RESTful APIs. There are six core principles that are needed to build a RESTful API, and they're called the REST constraints. I'm going to walk you through them one by one. The fundamental REST constraint is called the client-server constraint. This basically means that we want to split our system into the client interface and the server representing our actual API. This constraint promotes separation of concerns and it allows our client and server applications to evolve independently. The next REST constraint is called stateless, and this is probably one of the most misunderstood REST constraints. The stateless constraint means that the server shouldn't need to store any contextual information to be able to process an API request. In other words, a single API request should contain all of the information required for the API application to process that request and return a response to the caller. If you're familiar with MVC applications, they have a context of session state where you could store contextual information about the current user and be able to fetch this on demand. This would be a stateful approach. When we are building a RESTful API, we want to eliminate any intermediate state that's required to process the request. Now, this doesn't mean that we won't end up storing this information in a database server. That's not what the stateless constraint is about. What it is about is simply that the current API request should contain all of the information that's required to process this request. The next REST constraint is that our API request should be cacheable. In other words, they should clearly communicate to the client if they can safely cache the API response. This means that if the request is cacheable and the client wants to send the same request in the future, the client can check if they have a cached response for a given request and use that to satisfy the current request. If the cache has expired, then we're going to send the request to the API, but the essence here is that the API should communicate if you can cache an API response or not. The next constraint is probably the more interesting one, which is called the uniform interface constraint. And it actually consists of four guiding principles, which are identification of resources, manipulation of resources through representations, self-descriptive messages, and hypermedia as the engine of application state, also known as HateOS or HateOS, depending on how you pronounce it. I won't bore you with the details of these principles right now, we're going to discuss them in the practical part of this video. And we can move on to the next REST constraint, which is called Layer System, and this is essentially gives you the flexibility of how you want to deploy your RESTful API. It can consist of multiple layers, for example, a reverse proxy, an API server, a cache, a database, and all of this shouldn't concern the client application. The client application only wants to know how to send an API request to wherever the REST API is exposed, and it doesn't need to know that the server actually consists of multiple layers of components. And the last REST constraint, which you probably can't see as a whole because of my face, is code on demand. And this allows you to send an executable piece of code as an API response to the client where the client can execute this code. This could be a UI widget or a piece of JavaScript code, and this constraint is completely optional and it's not required to build a RESTful API, and you will very rarely see this used in the wild. So these are the six RESTful API constraints. Client server, stateless, cacheable, uniform interface, layered system, and code on demand. So that was the theoretical discussion, but now I want to move into a more practical discussion of RESTful APIs using the REST mature 
maturity levels. And I'm going to introduce these levels one by one, followed by a practical example of what an API looks like when it's built using that maturity level. And the first level, or the zero level, because we are engineers, is the swamp of POX. And POX stands for plain old XML, or if you are returning JSON, it could be swamp of podge, I guess, for plain old JSON. Now let's jump into Visual Studio and I'll show you what an API at level zero looks like. So I have a .NET 8 web API with a connection to a Postgres database. So our API server is a layer system with a .NET application and a Postgres database. I'm also configuring open telemetry, but this isn't so important for our discussion. What I want to focus on are the actual API endpoints. So we have an endpoint for getting a list of products, which is the one resource that we have. Then we have an endpoint for fetching one product by the ID, an endpoint for creating a product, for updating a product, and for removing a product. And if you're wondering what the heck this is, actually this is a relatively common way of how some developers build APIs. Most of the endpoints are treated as remote procedure calls, which you can tell by the naming convention for the endpoints. We're also not using HTTP verbs or methods at all, all of our endpoints are post endpoints, and this doesn't really matter because we are using different names to represent the operations that we want to execute on the server. So this is what a level zero API looks like. We are not paying attention to HTTP methods, we aren't paying attention to the API routes and using them in some sort of conventional way. But regardless of design, this API is functional. If I start this application, we will be able to send requests to these API endpoints and execute the behavior that we want to complete. So we are able to create a product, update a product, fetch the product, delete it, it doesn't really matter. Now let's see what the next level would be. So one level above the Swamp of Box or the Swamp of Podge, if you prefer, is level one. And this is where we start to introduce resource-based addresses or URIs to describe our API endpoints. So let's go back to our example and see how we can refactor it to elevate it from a level zero API to a level one API. I'm going to start from this endpoint here, and we're only going to concern ourselves with the URIs or the actual endpoint addresses for the endpoints that we have. So we want to introduce a concept of a resource that we are manipulating through an API. And in this example, the resource is a collection of products that we store in the database. The naming convention that I prefer to use is to represent my resources in plural. So this would be a products endpoint, and this is how I can obtain a list of products. This URI identifies the list of resources that I have inside of my database. If we continue with this logic, the next endpoint where we fetch one product would have a route of products, and then we would also append the identifier of this product as part of the route. So now this becomes our URI, the Uniform Resource Identifier. It consists of two components, the name of the resource, which is products, and also the identifier of this one resource that we are fetching through this endpoint. So let's continue in this fashion, and we're going to run into some conflicts that we will have to solve on a case-by-case -case basis. So in this next endpoint, we are creating a product, we are creating a new resource. So we can describe this with the products URI. However, since I'm using a post endpoint for all of my endpoints, then I'm going to run into a conflict on my API level. I can have two endpoints with the same URI and the same HTTP method. So I will have to make a compromise here by appending, for example, create to make this a distinct endpoint from the products endpoint for fetching all of the resources. And we're going to come back to this in our next example. For the other two endpoints that we have, we will have to make the same compromise. So in this example, the URI would be products and the identifier of the current product, but I also have to append the update into the URI to make this distinct from the endpoint for fetching a product. And I will do the same for the delete endpoint, and I'm going to append delete. So now we have elevated from a level zero API to a level one API, but you can see that this still has some problems and it's not all that different from a level zero API. And this is where the next level comes in, which is level two. And in this level, we are combining our resource-based URIs together with HTTP verbs or HTTP methods. These are get, post, put, delete, 
an optionally patch which isn't used too often and it allows you to update a part of a resource instead of having to update the entire resource. So let's see how we can update our API to elevate it to a level 2 API. So we said this is about HTTP methods and we're going to achieve this by using the correct HTTP method for the current endpoint. So in this case we want to fetch a resource from the server and we're going to use the get method. The same goes in the second example where we are fetching one product from our API. This is going to be a get endpoint, so I'm going to use map get. And in this example, the URIs do not have to change. The post endpoint is used for creating a new resource, and because I updated the products URI to be a get endpoint, now I can omit create from this route, use products, which is the resource that we are manipulating, and we can use the post endpoint. Now, when it comes to updating a product, you want to use the put endpoint, which is the correct endpoint for updating a product, and then we can omit update because this URI is now used in the get endpoint and the put endpoint, and these are different API endpoints. And the same goes in our last example, where we are going to use map delete to make this use the delete HTTP method, and I can also simplify the route to just contain the resource and the identifier of the specific product. I'm also going to make one more improvement to the current design of our API, by tagging the get endpoint for fetching one product. We can do this with minimal APIs by calling with tags, and I'm going to add the get product tag here. And this will allow me to update the response of my post endpoint to call created at route. I'm going to specify the get product name, and I have to pass in the identifier in the route, and this will allow me to return a location header pointing to the newly created resource. If you want to, you can optionally also return the identifier from this endpoint. But before starting, we just have to update this to be with name instead of with tag for this to actually work as expected. And now I can start my application. So here are the API endpoints that we are currently exposing through our API. We have a get endpoint for fetching all of the products, which is described with this URI. Then we have the same URI and a post endpoint for creating a new product, a URI for a specific product, which also contains the identifier, and a get put and delete endpoint for getting, updating, and deleting a product. So let's test this out. I want to create a new product. The ID is here only because I have a product DTO which contains the ID. So I'm going to update this to have a name, price, and description, and then send this request. And you can see that in the response, we get the identifier of the newly created product. I'm going to copy this. But in the location header of the response, we also get a fully qualified URI for fetching the current product. This is the same as calling this endpoint with the product ID. And now I can fetch one product in the response. I can also go ahead and update this product. Let's say I want to update the price to something larger like this and send this request and I'm going to get back a successful response. And I can also go ahead and delete this product and this is going to remove this resource from my database server. So this would be a level two API and this is probably where most people end up when building a RESTful API. And according to Roy Fielding's definition, this does not qualify as a RESTful API because one thing is missing. And that missing thing is hypermedia or H2S, and this is what qualifies our API as a level 3 API. Now, if you're enjoying this video so far, go ahead and smash the like button under this video so the YouTube algorithm knows to recommend this video to other .NET developers. And I'm going to show you what we need to do in our API to elevate it to level 3. So we will have to update the resource that we are returning from our API to include hypermedia. Hypermedia is essentially links that represent the actions that a client can take with a current resource. So I'm going to introduce a DTO to represent a link. The rel property is going to describe what is the operation that you can do with this link. And the href property is going to obtain a URI where you can send a request to to call a specific API endpoint. So I'm going to update my product DTO to contain a list of links. And this is just a simple implementation. We could make this more robust by also including the HTTP method that you should use with a given link, but I'm going to show you just the simplest approach possible. Now, how do we use these links? 
Well, I'm going to add them only in this endpoint as an example, and we will need to inject two additional services. One is going to be the link generator service, which is built in in ASP.NET Core, and I'm also going to need the HTTP context. So let's go ahead and inject that. And then I'm going to update the product DTO, if it's not null, to include a set of links. And I'm going to use collection expressions to initialize this because I think it's going to be simpler. And we're going to just add a couple of links to our API response. The first link is going to be called self. And this just allows us to get the current resource. I'm going to use the link generator to construct this URI and I will call get URI by name. The name of my endpoint is get product. Of course, the first argument is the HTTP context, and then I have to specify the endpoint name, and then I need to specify any route values. So let's say I pass in the product ID. I can also pass in the ID directly to make this a bit simpler. And in case we get a null response, I'm going to use null coalescing to return an empty string. Let's go ahead and copy this a few more times because I want to add a couple of more links and the next one is going to be called list and this will allow me to list all of my products and it doesn't contain any route values. Then I'm going to add an update link and a delete link which are going to use the update product endpoint and the delete product endpoint and the route argument is the ID of the product. Now I'm going to have to add the names to my specific endpoints. So this will be get products. This is our post endpoint, which I'm not going to decorate. The put endpoint will be called update product and the delete endpoint will be called delete product. So now we are enriching our response, the product DTO, to also contain hypermedia. This is going to be links to the actions that you can take on the current resource. And this helps us to make our RESTful API discoverable which means the client is able to figure out how to continue using our API based on the API response alone. So let's go ahead and start the application and let me show you what this looks like. I'm going to fetch the one product with a given ID and this is the response that we get. I'm going to open this up in VS Code because it's going to be easier to review the response and what I want to focus on is the links property of my response. So you can see we have four links. The first one is the self link, which contains a URI for fetching the current instance of the product. Then we have another link called list, where we can list this resource and it's going to give us back all of the products. Then we have the update link, where we can send a request to this endpoint, which you can see is the same URI in all of these cases, but the semantics is different because this is a put endpoint and we can send a request here to update the product. And we can also send a delete request to this endpoint or this URI to remove a product from our system. And based on Roy Fielding's definition, if you aren't using HateOS, your API isn't RESTful. However, these days, I rarely see HateOS being used when building APIs. And I think it can be an interesting discussion on why HateOS hasn't seen some wider adoption. And this covers the four levels of RESTful APIs. We have Swamp of Box on level zero. On level one, we start using URIs to describe our API endpoints. On level two, we are also using HTTP methods together with URIs, and this is where most of the APIs out there will be on level two. Now on level three, we are also expanding our API responses with hypermedia, and we are leveraging HateOS. Now let me know in the comments if your API is fully RESTful according to Roy Fielding's definition, or if it's on a lower level than level three. If you want to continue learning about RESTful APIs, I suggest that you watch this playlist next, where I have a set of videos about building a RESTful API completely from scratch. Check out my clean architecture and modular monolith courses to improve your skills, and until next time, stay awesome.